I grew up in the 60s and 70s when everybody was asking, who am I? That eternal search for identity. I never really got too involved in that. I was not that self-reflective. I pretty much just was who I was. I was a son to my wonderful mom and dad and a brother to my brother and two sisters. Eventually, I became a husband, and, uh, and that's been one of my roles for, for 45 years. And that led to being a father, which was a wonderful, time-consuming role. And then a role I cherished, grandfather, which I think is the best of all roles. I've been a pastor now for four decades, more than, more than four decades, in five different churches. Florida, Virginia, and uh, two in Iowa, and then now here. But these are what I do. Uh, they're, in a sense, who I am. But I also have a name. I think I shared this with you one time. David Lewis, L-E-W, not L-O-U, L-E-W, Lewis Miller. Miller is German. Pennsylvania Dutch, I guess Pennsylvania Deutsch. Uh, Lewis was my dad's name. Uh, David from the Shepherd King of Israel, and uh, I go by Dave generally, not Dave unless I was in trouble. I, there are Dave Millers everywhere. It's nothing unique, and and I I never have felt like my name was who I was. But we have been studying the names of God. Uh, we looked at the first two primary names. Uh, Elohim and Adonai. We have studied those in previous messages. They're all available if you want to go back and look at them if you haven't gotten all of them. But Elohim describes God's role, his office as creator, ruler, and king of the universe. Adonai, which we looked at the last two weeks, shows him as the master of the universe, the one who holds all authority and power. He is has the right to rule over the universe that he created. He is God. He is Lord. But he also has a name. He has a name. And, uh, and that name, which generally we translate as Yahweh, you see it in our songs that we sang today. And today we're going to study that personal name of God, Yahweh, and we're going to see what it means. And we're going to do that by beginning to study two familiar, uh, especially the first one, wonderful passages of Scripture, both in Exodus, Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 6. First of all, Exodus 3. And in Exodus 3, God appears to Moses out of a bush that's on fire but not being consumed. Now, if you're in the dry desert and you see a bush on fire, it's probably not that unusual, but it it burns up probably rather quickly because it's dry. But here Moses comes on this bush and it's on fire, but it's clear that it's not a normal fire because the bush is not being burned up. It's just burning, but it's not being burned up. And I believe that there is... Now, God's not a comedian, but I believe there is some humor in God. Not only God's against laughter, like I say, he's not a comedian, but I think he does things sometimes that show some level of humor. And I think he does this with, I would love to, my dad used to have a doctrine, he called the Doctrine of the Divine Videotapes, which shows you how old the doctrine was, uh, because he talked about videotapes. But uh, he thought we'd be able to sit in heaven and watch videotapes of earthly events. I don't know if he actually believed it, but I think it'd be hilarious to watch this one. The look on Moses' face when he, maybe a look of joy, maybe confusion too, because why is God telling me this? I'm just a shepherd of Midian. 40 years ago I thought I was somebody important, but now I'm just a shepherd out in the desert. But God comes to him and says, I have heard the cries of the people of Israel I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to rescue them. And Moses, I'm sure, was filled with glee. I'm thrilled, God. Thank you. Wonderful. You're going to rescue the people. 
that is great. And what I would like to see is the look on Moses' face, that joy, that glee, turn to horror in the next few seconds. As God says in verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now Moses is a shepherd. Pharaoh is a king of the most powerful army on earth. And Moses, I'm sure, begins to remind God, hey God, you know that plaque I have on my wall that says, God will never give you more than you can handle? <laughs> I can't handle this. This is the most powerful man on earth with the most powerful army on earth. And I think what Moses does next is very reasonable. It turns into excuse making. But in Exodus chapter 3, he asks God a question. He says, who am I to do such a thing? It's reasonable. I'm a shepherd. He's the king. If God told you, go tell Putin to get out of the Ukraine, you'd say, no, wait, God... Let's talk about this a minute. Who am I to, you know, they won't even let me in the Kremlin. He was a shepherd. And God answers him in verse 12 and says to him, I will be with you. I'll go with you. God was setting him on an overwhelming task with only one promise. I'll go with you. I'll be there with you. And so Moses' follow-up question was entirely reasonable. Who are you? If you're sending me on a quest that will certainly end in my death, and you give me only one promise, I'll go with you. I want to know who you are. And so he says, verses 13 and, and eventually 14, he says, now he, he does it very passive aggressively. He says, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say, what's his name? What should I tell them? You know, he doesn't directly confront God. He just kind of goes around in circles. But now these people, he blames it on them. They're going to say, who is this God you're talking about? What should I say to them? Do you have a name, Lord? What should I tell the people when they ask me who you are? And God answers the question, and he reveals his name to Moses. He, he gives it straight out in, in verse 14. He gives his, his name directly and simply. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me, has sent me to you. God's name was I am, or I am who I am. Oh, look, I am today. I don't feel like it, but I am. I'm tired, but I am. But I am because something else is. I'm only here today because of air. I'm here because of water and food and shelter and many other things. I exist because of other things. I am dependent on things for my existence to continue. I am because I depend on other things. God is self-existent. I said before, the name Dave Miller is, is something you call me when you want to get my attention, or David Lewis, or whatever else. Uh, it, 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 it describes who I am. It's a way to get a hold of my attention. It doesn't describe the essence of my being. Yahweh is the essence of God's being. It describes who he is. He exists in and of himself. I am 
and nothing else. He's not dependent on anyone or anything else. You know, we sometimes say God needs this or God needs that. No, folks. He loves, but he doesn't need. He just is. He always was. That's the hardest part. The idea that God will always exist, I, I, I get that. That the, guy, the idea that God always has existed, that he never began, that kind of sprains my brain to think about. That he never began, that's harder for me to exist. He created everything, but nothing created him. He causes everything, but nothing causes him. These things will kind of blow your mind when you try to think about it. He is our God, our great I Am. Now, in Hebrew, we're going to give a little bit of Hebrew lesson here. Hebrew is not written with vowels, only consonants. Only has consonants when they write it down. And God's name is for consonants. Y-H-W-H. You could probably have Y-H-V-H if you want. It could be that way, but we usually write it Y-H-W-H. And it's often called the Tetragrammaton. That means four letters. But we like to show off that we know big words, so we call it the Tetragrammaton. Uh, okay, aren't you impressed? You're likely more familiar with the name Jehovah. That's the name we've used for years and years, and there's a reason for that. It's a misunderstanding. Now, I'm going to share this with you. I think I may have shared it before. And it's, it's not going to change your life, but at least explains the, the beginning of the name Jehovah. Israel was given this name to call God by his name. It was a privilege. But they were also given a warning do not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. Do not use Yahweh's name in vain. And they became superstitious and afraid of using God's name in vain. So they stopped using God's name at all. And when they would read in the Hebrew Bible the name Yahweh, they would say the name Adonai. When they would be reading the Hebrew Bible and they saw Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, they would say Adonai instead. And so whenever they were reading out loud and Yahweh appeared, the name of Yahweh, your God, they would say Adonai, your God. And that's what they would say out loud. So they would say Adonai instead of Yahweh. Now, later on, there was a group called the Masoretes. Again, I know that blesses your soul, but that's what they were called, the Masoretes. And they came along and they added vowels to the Hebrew text. And they did it with dots and dashes, mostly dots. They're called vowel points. And they added dots and dashes to the Hebrew text. Um, a, a, a line underneath is an A. Uh, three dots underneath is an E sound. And that, once again, you don't care probably. But that. So what they did when they came along and they added the, the vowels to Yahweh, they added the vowels for Adonai, because that's what the Hebrews said. They added the vowels for Adonai to the letters for Yahweh. And when later on people began to read that, they said, okay, it's like, yeah, or you know, they, they, they read it a certain way, and eventually then people that didn't know what they were doing said it must be Jehovah or something like that. And so I think it was translated into Latin or something like that. Uh, and so that's how we got the name Je Jehovah, was because they added the, le the vowels to Adonai onto the letters for <coughs> Yahweh. Don't you feel like your life has just become more meaningful now? By <laughs> We're going to stick with Yahweh, which may not be the completely accurate uh, pronunciation, but it's close to it. Uh, and you'll also notice in almost every English translation, when the word Yahweh appears in the Hebrew text, it is translated as Lord in the Old Testament with a capital L, and O-R-D is in smaller capital letters. So you can always tell it's Yahweh because it's a smaller O-R-D. 
So it's Lord. It's capital L, capital O R D. The ORD is in smaller letters. That's how you know Yahweh appears. Now, don't miss the blessing of all this. All of that is kind of arcane, whatever. But the blessing is simple. God gave his name to Moses. You know, this used to be really, you know, everybody was called Mr. This, Mr. That, Mrs. This, Mrs. That. Only your best friends got to call you by your first name. Only your family and your best friends got your, got your name. God gave his name to Israel. He was about to enter into a covenant with them, and he, he would take them from slavery and would give his, his covenant on Mount Sinai and be their God, and they would be his people. And when he had saved them and entered into a covenant with them, he gave them his name, the God of heaven, the creator, the Lord of all, entered into a personal relationship with people with his people, in which he was with them, and he said, call me by my name. Listen to this, folks. The God of heaven is willing to enter into a personal I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession, for I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. The stunning blessing of all this sometimes goes over our head. We are a sinful people. I, I, again, I don't think I have to convince you of that, do I? In your heart, in my heart, we know we're sinners. And the only thing that sinners have the right to from God is judgment. That's all we have. The, you say, well, I want, I want what's coming to me. I want my rights. I demand my rights. Well, the only thing sinners have the right to from God is eternal judgment. But here he says, what I'm going to give you is the land that I promised you. I'm going to, I'm going to, because I am Yahweh, your God, I'm going to give you the land. God looked down and heard their cries and sent a deliverer. Now, God looked down on the wickedness of this world, wickedness that often, you know, we look at it and we're like, why is this world so wicked? And we're disgusted and angry and sometimes even judgmental. But God decided not to respond with fire and brimstone on this world, but he sent his son to offer salvation to bring people into a relationship with him. And he's worked since before time to bring us to salvation and to show his love and to reveal himself fully to this world so that we can call him by name. What a remarkable, unbelievable blessing. 
God is more, the holy, perfect God is more patient with this world than we who are sinners are sometimes. We're just so dismissive of it, aren't we? It's like, oh, this world is so terrible. Yes, it is. But the God who is perfect looks at this world. Remember when Jesus looked at Jerusalem? How there's one true God, El, Elohim. And he is over all the universe, creator or king. You don't get a choice as to whether Elohim is your God or not. You can decide to worship a false God. You can reject the existence of God, but he's still your God. You can say, I, I am atheist. I don't believe in the existence of God. Well, big fat whoop. I don't think that's very classy. But that, that's actually Hebrew, folks. Well, I've studied Hebrew and you haven't, so how do you know? No, he's God whether you believe in him or not. I reject the existence of gravity. I don't believe in gravity. Oops. You know what gravity just said to me? Big fat whoop. <laughs> gravity doesn't care whether I believe in it or not. It's still gravity. It still rules over me. Elohim is Elohim. He's the creator. He's the Lord, whether you believe in him or not. But some people choose to submit to Elohim as Lord, small O-R-D, Adonai, and yield full control. Boy, that hurt. My knee. No. <laughs> Yielding full control of their lives to Adonai in humility and service, and others don't. To those who yield to the one true God as Lord, he enters into a covenant, a personal relationship, and he gives the right to know him by his personal name. The great I am, Yahweh. There's only one God. If you yield to him as Lord, as Adonai, he becomes your personal God. And you know him personally by his name, Yahweh. Now, there's one more thing I want to say before I'm done. Don't get too excited. It's going to take me a minute or two to say it. But I want you to think back to the revelation of God's name. When God first told Moses that his name was Yahweh, he gave Moses a task that was beyond his abilities. To face Pharaoh and deliver the people from slavery. He didn't promise Moses an army. He didn't promise him weapons. He just gave him one promise. He said, I will be with you. It's amazing how often the great I am sends people on impossible tasks in the Old Testament with only that promise. He says, my presence will be with you. I will go with you. He says, come into a relationship with me, a covenant with me, and then I'll send you on adventures you can't even imagine. Often those adventures will involve danger and peril, and if I don't act, you will die in horrible ways. What an offer God gives. I'm going to send you on an adventure, and if I don't do my part, your death will be horrible. Just read the Old Testament and see how many times God does that. Sends people on a task, and if God doesn't act in power, those people's lives are short and painful. But then God never leaves them. He never, never abandons them. He never lets them down. Let me ask you a question today, just to get nasty. What are you willing to do? Where are you willing to go? What task are you willing to undertake with the only promise God gives you I will be with you. Yahweh will be with you. It's the only promise we should need. His presence is so powerful that if he is with us, nothing can stand against us, nothing can stop us, nothing can hinder us. Yahweh sent Moses to Egypt with the promise, I will be with you. What happened? Pharaoh's armies ended up in a wet ditch. Moses led the people out. In Exodus 4.12, Moses was concerned about his ability to speak to Pharaoh because he didn't speak well. And God said, I want you as my spokesman. And Moses said, I don't speak so well. And God said, now, therefore, go, and I will be your mouth, and I will teach you what to speak. 
I will be there. I'll empower you to do what I'm calling you to do. In Deuteronomy 31, God was using Moses to send Joshua and Israel into the promised land to fight army after army after army that was bigger and stronger and better equipped than they were. What did Moses promise them when he sent Joshua on his way? It is Yahweh who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Yahweh's going with you. There's nothing to be afraid of, even though every army there can destroy you. They're all bigger than you. They're all better than you, but there's nothing to be afraid, nothing to be afraid of if Yahweh goes with you. When God came to I love the story of Gideon. <laughs> Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Gideon is hiding down in the threshing floor from the Midianites, and God comes to him, and guess what he calls him? I am with you, mighty warrior. This guy's hiding, and God calls him a mighty warrior. And you know what Gideon says? I think you got the wrong guy, Lord. <laughs> no. It's not about who Gideon... Gideon was not a mighty warrior until God got him. But when God gets a wimpy coward... And that coward walks in faith. Guess what that coward becomes? A mighty warrior. Folks, we have taught people all my life, do your best for God. And the Bible never says it's about you and what you can do. The Bible always says, God never said, do your best for me. So this is a coward hiding. He just says, Give your whole self to me, and I'll turn you into something you never were. I'll make you a mighty warrior, coward. God turns coward. What were the disciples? I, I got no time for this, folks. The, the disciples were a bunch of cowards. And what did God make them? World-changing missionaries. Listen. Listen. What you are and what you do for God today does not depend on who you are, what you are, or what you can do. It depends on Yahweh, the great I am who dwells in you. Now i got to move on. Stop distracting me. Stop it, people. In Judges 6.16, Yahweh said, I will be with you, and you will strike the Midianites as one man. One coward in the power of God an entire 200, 180,000, I think it was, they couldn't stand against him. Here's what Isaiah 43, 20, 2 and 3 says. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned and the flame will not consume you. For I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now, aren't you glad that God doesn't ask you to do that today? Please don't amen me. He used to send people out on those difficult, dangerous tasks, and the only promise he gave them was, I'll be with you. Whew. Good thing he doesn't do that today, right? Hmm. Let's think about this. I'm remembering a job that God gave us, our marching orders. In the military, you know what marching orders are called? A commission. And I remember one that was so big, it was called a great commission. Think about this. Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Go into all nations. You know, there's some of those nations that don't want us there. Sometimes your next-door neighbor doesn't want you there. But, but go to every nation. There's a lot of those nations that put Christians to death. There's a lot of nations that, that don't want us there. But we have the orders of our king that say, go to all the nations and make disciples. You know what that means? That means take people that hate Jesus and don't want to obey him and lead them to love Jesus and obey him. How many of you can turn a sinner into a saint? Please, again, don't raise your hand. That's an impossible task. Yet, that's the task you've been given. 
we have been given the task to go all around the world and turn sinners into saints. And I can tell you, I have been in a lot of places in this world, and I am not equipped to turn sinners into saints anywhere. Tecama, Nebraska, Iowa, or anywhere in this world. And yet that's the task we've been given. Well, how do we do it? Well, guess what? There's one more part to this verse. He gave us a promise. Does it sound familiar? Behold, I am with you always. That's the same promise he gave to Moses. Yahweh says, I'm with you. He gave us a great commission, and the only promise he said was, I'll be with you. He put his Holy Spirit in you. All Moses had was the promise that God would go with him. To us, he says, I'll be in you. I'll indwell you. We have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. God calls us to tasks that are so far beyond our ability, it boggles our mind. But just like he did with Moses and Joshua and Gideon and David and all the rest of the Old Testament heroes, he says, I will be with you. In fact, he says, I will be in you. I will empower you. The great I am, the self-existent, powerful God of the universe dwells within us and empowers us to do everything he calls us to do. Can I get one little amen just to make me feel better? He is here with us, and he will empower us if we walk in obedience. Two things I know today. As we close, this really is the close. So wake your neighbor up. This is the close. God has amazing things that he wants to do in you and through you and in this church and through this church. And secondly, those things do not depend on our abilities or our efforts in the slightest, but on the powerful abilities of Yahweh, the great I am. And there's nothing he can't do. What God could do in a church that based what it wanted to do on the abilities of God, not on the abilities of themselves. The great I am. He's alive. What if we lived our lives? I'll bet you every single one of you here believes in the resurrection. Jesus is alive. What if we lived our lives daily with the belief that we serve a risen Savior and He's in the world today and He's working through us? Satan would shake. I don't even know if he wears boots. But he'd shake in them. Because there's nothing more powerful than Christians and churches walking in the power of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, I pray that we would live in the power of the living Lord Jesus Christ. May the great I am live through us. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen.